Good morning and welcome to Grand Rounds. The clock in the back of the room is a little bit uh, tardy, but we're on time, so that's what matters. Good morning. Um, today's speaker is Dr. Raul Pandey. He's one of our esteemed pediatric ICU specialists. Dr. Pandey did his pediatric residency in New York Medical College, but most importantly, he did his pediatric ICU fellowship the University of Florida, fellow Gator. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, Dr. Miller, for a uh, nice introduction uh, this morning. So, uh, folks, I'm going, to talk, I'm going to talk about uh, traumatic brain injury in pediatrics. Uh, I know that's a kind of a purely ICU-rich uh, <laughs> uh, topic, uh, so I, I like it, and uh, I hope it is fruitful for you guys as well. Uh, I'll try to make it as simple as possible, uh, but still, if, if it, uh, it goes uh, a little bit too much, uh, I apologize from the start. <laughs> uh, okay, so no disclosures. Uh, so the current uh, so objective for today's talk is to understand the mechanism of uh, traumatic brain in injury, to understand the pathophysiology, and uh, to understand the uh, management of TBI, mostly ICU management. That's, that's what I'm going to talk about. So <clears throat> the epidemiology, uh, so as we all know, uh, you know injury is, is a leading cause of death in kids, and 40% uh, unfortunately is by uh, uh, traumatic brain injury, and the mortality is somewhere around one third, uh, approximately uh, one fourth to one third in that range, uh, and uh, you know it causes a lot of lot of disability in the long run. And uh, as per the last census, I mean, there were like approximately three thousand kids who die uh, because of TBI. Pathophysiology. So, so traumatic traumatic brain injury. Uh, you know, basically there are two major types, uh, you know, injury, the, the primary injury is the one which, you know, makes, makes all the problem, like, you know, the, you know, the, uh, the, the trauma, that's the primary injury, and the secondary injury is the one which actually takes place afterwards. So, in general, primary, we don't have control over the primary injury, because that's what, that's what's this cause, right? Accident or whatever, fall, and the secondary injury is something that we have some control. <clears throat> That's how, we, that's how I like to think about it. Uh, and the primary injury, uh, it, couldn't be, it could be further differentiated uh, into focal and diffuse, okay? So as you can imagine, like th there's a, this is a baseball bat right here hitting the front of the uh, skull right here and causing immediate primary impact and causing uh, injury in the, so this is just an example. It could be, you know, uh, so basically injury right here because of the blunt force, uh, either because of the baseball or fall or whatever. And sometimes the injury is so bad that, you know, the brain actually shakes and cause, cause injury on the back part. Uh, it's called a secondary impact. Uh, in some places, actually, it's also called a coup and counter coup. Uh, so uh, this, can, this could lead to contusion, hematomas, and all that. And <clears throat> it can also cause, uh, so that, that was, the previous slide actually showed more of focal damage right? And this is more of diffuse damage. Uh, it's called as diffuse axonal injury. So what really happens is, you know, when you have, you know, the acceleration and deacceleration forces, you know, those uh, axons, they are basically, you know, twisted around, right? Uh, so this is a white, predominant white matter injury, right? Uh, and uh, so if you look at this picture, there's like shared axon, twisted axon, and stretch. So all these things actually cause more of like a diffuse axonal injury uh, in short form, it's called a DAI, and it's pretty common, actually. <clears throat> and these are the secondary injury, which, uh, you know, which happens afterwards, uh, mostly hypoxemia, hypotension, elevated ICPs, hypercarbia, hyper or hypoglycemia, some electrolyte abnormalities, enlarging hematomas, coagulopathy, seizures, hyperthermia. So these are the, these are the, uh, uh, avoidable injuries uh, that happens afterwards. So, so what is a normal ICP, student? 
any, any, anyone? Okay, so less than, less than 15 is kind of like, uh, it's kind of the range, uh, less than 20, I would say. Uh, so, but yeah, so, but, but in kids, we always like to think like, you know, it's lower than the adults, but typically anything above 20 is abnormal. Uh, and in, in pediatrics, we, we think about uh, 15 or less. <clears throat> Uh, and as the, as as you know, like anything like sneezing, coughing, valsalvas, manure, all those things actually causes increased ICP transiently. And anything above 20, as I said, is abnormal. <clears throat> so what is ICP? So as ICP, I think in my mind, I always think about CSF. But basically, it's not just CSF. It's mostly the brain parenchyma. It comp uh, it makes 80% of the pressure, the CSF, and the blood. Right, and uh, the ICP, the intracranial pressure, is basically nicely. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a there's a principle called the Monroe Kelly uh, uh, principle. Well, I'll show in a second right here. So, so if you look at this compartment, so there are, there are three different compartments. So the first compartment is a normal compartment, basically, and if you look at this, uh, this purple color is the brain in all these three compartments. The yellow is the arterial volume. And the the blue is supposed to be uh, is supposed to be venous, and the green is supposed to be CSF. Now this is normal. There's no mass in this. <clears throat> if you have a mass, basically something has to shift, something has to move, because it's a closed cavity. So when the mass is relatively smaller, it's 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 compensated partially. But if the mass gets bigger, there's no way the CSF and the veins, you know, the venous blood has space. So basically it moves and causes raised, like, really, like severely raised ICP. So basically what it says is that since skull is, a, is basically a closed uh, structure, if you have additional volume in that skull, it's just going to move substances. So that's what it means. And this is a, this is a graph. So if you look up the x-axis, that's, a, that's a intracranial volume. And the y-axis is the ICP, right? So basically what it says is as the volume, the intracranial volume increases slowly, the ICP also increases. So the initial part, it's very, it goes up really slow, but after a certain point, it just shoots up. So the same thing, right? So because there's only a little space in the skull, uh, like, you know, to, and there's only a little room in the skull basically to, uh, to prevent higher pressures. After a certain amount, after a certain, uh, uh, amount it, just, it just shoots up. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll not go into very details. I just want to show uh, that, that the body, you know, uh, the brain actually, uh, in pressures between 50 to 150 of mass, the brain tries to auto-regulate. So what it really means is that if the blood pressure is on the lower side, like if you, so normal maps, I would say around 80 to 90, even 100, right? So in that range, right, for adults. So if the blood pressure is lower than that, the arteries, they dilate to compensate for perfusion. Does it make sense? Now, if the blood pressure is on the higher side, what really happens is the arteries the blood vessels, they actually narrow, they constrict, and decrease the perfusion. So basically, between this number 50 and 150, because of this constriction and vasodilatation of the vessels, you know, the brain perfusion is basically is, 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 is not hampered. But as soon as it, goes below, it falls below that 50 and above 150 in that range, all problems arise, okay? So basically, there's more uh, ischemia, there's uh, edema, and all those things. Uh, but so I just wanted to make sure that you guys understand that the brain is nicely auto-regulated. Okay. So with the TBI, what really happens is this auto-regulation is hampered. That's one of the other problems, which, again, like a secondary problem after the injury. You guys are with me? Okay. Now that brings. Uh, we talk about the perfusion and everything. That brings to a very important concept in, uh, in traumatic brain injury. Uh, we always talk about this, 
uh, something called a cerebral perfusion pressure. So basically, if you look, uh, if you look at the, uh, let me show this. Okay, okay, this is, uh, this is the, what I made myself. Uh, so this is copyright now. <laughs> uh, so. So if you see this, uh, imagine this as a skull. So this is just a schematic diagram, so it's not real. But uh, so imagine this as a skull, the bigger, bigger circle as a skull, and the inner circle as ICP, okay? And this is the artery, this is the vein, right? So blood going in, blood coming out, and there is ICP, right? So if you look at the, this equation, CPP is, is going to be, uh, you know, Mass is going to be mass minus ICP, so mean arterial pressure minus ICP. So if my mass are lower, my CPP is going to be lower. Or on the other way around, if the ICP is high, which is our topic today, <laughs> uh, the CPP is going to be lower, right? So, so just and uh, you know, look at this picture. So I've drawn a bigger arrow and a smaller arrow. So typically, in a normal patient, this is always a small, has to be a smaller arrow, and this has to be a bigger arrow, so that the brain is perfused. Does it, does it make sense, you guys? So, so that's how the brain is perfused. And again, this is a very simplistic way to explain it. All right? And again, so the so CPP in adults is 60 to 70. So whenever we talk about CPP or the cerebral perfusion pressure, we always talk about uh, you know a number. Now, of course, in pediatrics, because the maths are lower, depending on the age, and also the ICP might be a little bit lower. The CPP is generally lower than, uh, than the adults, typically in the range of uh, somewhere around 40 to uh, 60, at least, in that range. Uh, of course, if they are more, uh, more adult size kids, then they, are, they have adult-like numbers, okay? All right. So we come to the next uh, <clears throat> uh, part, which initial evaluation. So basically, uh, this happens in the ER, right? We do primary surveys. Don't forget the ABCs, do secondary survey. Uh, it's very important to know the mechanism of injury, right? So that's important because then you can actually, if the, if the injury is from like, you know, say one feet, like fall from one feet versus fall from 10 feet, if the patient uh, hit his head directly versus he did not hit the directly, or you know, I'm just giving an example. So really, the mechanism is very important to actually, you know, to anticipate what kind of what kind of problems or what, what kind of injury you're going to be uh, witnessing. Uh, if there was any LOC, loss of consciousness, that's important. And if there was, how how long was it? Was there any vomiting, any headache, right? Because it's uh, it's actually the commonest uh, sign and the earliest sign for a raised. Uh, ICP and how the patient is developing in terms of his neuro exam. Is he getting worse? Is he same? Is he got better? What is it? So all the things in the history is very important to know. Okay. So physical exam. <clears throat> so it's very important in the ER uh, or in the outside hospital when our transport team goes. It's very important to identify, uh, you know, if there's any hypoxia the patient is having, or if there's any hypotension that's happening because those are again remember the secondary injury. So the primary injury has already happened. We could have some control in the secondary injury, right, preventing some of the secondary injury. So that's why uh, looking for hypoxia and treating the hypoxia and hypotension should be the goal, okay? <clears throat> you also have, want to see if there is any, if the patient is breathing appropriately, there is no respiratory depression. Look at the heart rate, meaning if there is bradycardia, hypertension, you're already, th you're already thinking about what? Cushing triad, right? Cushing reflex. So that's basically, <clears throat> if there's bradycardia, you know, just get very excited. Uh, hypertension and basically all that. Uh, and then always, always have your C-spine immobilized in these situations, irrespective. <clears throat> now, neuro exam. So basically, you want to assign a GCS. We're going to talk about GCS in a, in a couple of slides. Uh, and uh, talk about the level of consciousness. Look at the pupils. Extraocular exam. Uh, movement, fundoscopic exam, brain stem reflexes, uh, deep inner reflexes, and response to pain. Okay. <clears throat> so the Glasgow mosaic scale. Uh, so, well, you know the the traumatic brain injury is basically you could actually put into three different class. 
uh, depending on the scale of GCS. So the GCS is between 13 to 15. That's mild. <laughs> uh, so by the way, uh, students again, for uh, what is the lowest GCS that you can assign to any person? Okay, good. Uh, so GCS of 13 to 15 is mild. Moderate GCS 9 to 12, and uh, severe GCS is less than 9. Now, you know, I've always struggled with GCS, remembering all this. Uh, so the best way, actually, I remember it, I just remember this mnemonic EVM, 456. So, so eyes is 4 maximum, verbal is, uh, is 5, and uh, motor is 6. So if you look at the <coughs> number assigned, uh, so the, the lower the number, the worse is the patient, right? The higher the number, the better the patient. It's very straightforward. <coughs> okay, so what is this? Vital sign. Vital sign. So, okay, what is it? What is the significance? Basal skull fracture. <coughs> okay, next one. So, uh, I've already given it away. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, raccoon eyes, uh, hemotympanum. And this is, this is not really seen as, and this is probably a bronchiolitis, basically. <laughs> 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 I just... <laughs> but because the patient looks really good for a rhinorrhea, right? He has a rhinorrhea. <laughs> TCS of 15. <laughs> okay. Uh, how about this? Where do you see this so commonly, like? Huh? Hydrocephalus? So basically raised ICP, right? Bad. So late sign of increased uh, ICP pressure. And uh, basically, because of increased pressure, it can cause, uh, you know, compression of the nerves uh, 3, 4, and 6, uh, making the eye go down. And uh, looks like a sun setting appearance, <laughs> right? Just a slide to show uh, how, uh, looks, uh, how the retinal, uh, retina looks in trauma. Uh, with all those hemorrhages in here. Okay, so types of herniation. Uh, <clears throat> so remember, like you know, whenever you have injury, uh, you have swelling, right? Uh, so same, the brain also behaves the same way. So when you have all this shearing injuries, acceleration, deacceleration injuries, what really happens is all the neurotransmitters, you know, the, are, are out uh, because of the you know, because of the broken blood-brain barrier. And also there are a lot of cytokines and a lot of electrolytes which are out. So causing, in the end result, is brain edema, right? And if the pressure is just mounting, the, the pressure is just mounting, since, again, Monroe Kelly hypo principle, right? So if the, so, so the, because the skull is a closed, it's a closed path. So if the pressure is mounting, it has to, it has to come out somehow, somehow. So the easiest, the most common that we talk about is you know, we talk about the tonsillar herniation, right? Uh, that there is a hole right here, foramen magnum just comes out from there, right? Because of the increased pressure. So that's tonsillar herniation for you guys, right? And that is really, really, a, you know, if you, if you have a patient who has tonsillar herniation, you can also, you know, all this, uh, you know, the optic nerves, and all, uh, not the optic nerve, but the uh, oculomotor and all the nerves actually are right there. So you'll actually basically see an isochoria and all those signs. Uh, <clears throat> you know, all the pupil signs uh, with that. You can also see with the tonsillar herniation, uh, you know, bradycardia, respiratory depression, because, you know, the, uh, the, uh, all the centers, respiratory centers and the cardiac centers are right there, right? <clears throat> now, the other types uh, are, you know, sub sign, basically, the, the, you know, because of the one-sided uh, expansion of the cerebral hemisphere that basically pushes uh, in the brain tissue, so that's that's a subfile sign. That's this is the extra extra cranial. Uh, I've never seen this. Uh, and this is the uncle herniation right here, and this is a central uh, transtentorial herniation. So even uncle herniation can cause uh, you know the pupillary signs that I was talking about. <laughs> okay, again same thing. Uh, so uncle herniation, third cranial cranial nerve palsy. It can also cause hemiplegia, and again. Uh, because of the herniation, you can have respiratory, uh, you know, depression. Pupil size might be uh, bigger. They might be less responsive. 
uh, and they can have four shrink. And again, talking about the Cushing triad, which really occurs late. I mean, if you're looking, if you really have, if you, if your patient really has a Cushing triad, basically you're, you're uh, far behind the game. Um, so basically, hypertension, bradycardia, and irregular respirations. <clears throat> Just try to show my mediasis uh, because of un uncle herniation. Okay, labs. Uh, so, what kind of labs do you require in a patient with TBI? Probably just basic labs, uh, H and H. You know, type and screen. If the patient has uh, has polytrauma, require uh, uh, type and screen. Maybe blood transfusion, <coughs> right? Uh, you require you know, also BMP. I would say you know require a basic electrolyte uh, uh, labs, <clears throat> and uh, glucose is important because you know there are studies which say that if you have hyperglycemia, that's a bad prognostic indicator, and also DIC. Uh, sorry, uh, if the coags are uh, if the coags are bad, then uh, if the patient has DIC, that there are bad outcomes. Now CT scan. Uh, that's the main thing uh, for imaging. Uh, that's actually done as soon as the patient is stabilized, and uh, you can see focal injuries. And uh, some of the patients who have <coughs> axonal injuries, most of the patients actually, the CT scans sometimes can appear normal uh, or, or less abnormal. Uh, but you know that does not mean. So if you if you if you see a patient who has significant clinical exam and the CT scan is does not show any 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 uh, findings, that does not mean that the patient does not have problems. But that means the problem is about to arise maybe in next, uh, meaning the CD scan uh, features would be seen after a couple of days. So I'll, I'll get to those images in a, in a second. So this is normal CT scan. I've just put some pictures. So, and again, there, there are smiley signs right here, right? So, so if we look at those images right here, right here, so all the spaces are open. And to me, they look like, you know, like smiling brain, brain, right? Or frowning brain, right? Here. <clears throat> so look for those because it's very important. So because that really means that all the spaces, all the systems are open, lateral ventricles are open, uh, you know, the third ventricle is open. So that is on a space, right? So this one really looks like this one, right? <laughs> this one. Okay. So it's basically it's informally called as a uh, uh, smiley sign. It's not formal. Okay. <clears throat> okay, what is this? Huh? So this is subdural, right? Uh, and also there's like some uh, uh, midline shift right here. So basically this is because of, you know, because of the uh, uh, injury to the bridging veins, right? And this is, this is a pedural. Like the, you see the length, uh, the length shape. And this is again, this is between the dura and the, uh, and the skull. And uh, basically, of the uh, because of the uh, uh, arterial injuries, most common the middle uh, meningeal artery, right? All right. Remember, I was talking about DAI just a minute ago. Uh, so this is the this is a uh, you know CT scan of a DAI where you see small hematomas, like a small 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 hemorrhages, not hematoma, but like small hemorrhages right here, right here, right here. And overall, the brain does not look that bad. The brain is still smiling, right? Uh, but if you wait, like for 48 hours, sometimes, some, some, sometimes three days, the brain would look like this. And what is this? So you don't see a space, right? You don't see a smiling brain anyway uh, uh, right now, right? Because there's no space. It's all, you see that there's no gray and white matter differentiation anymore. There's no space. So this is, this is cerebral edema, okay? And going back to DAI, uh, you know, the best way to diagnose, uh, sometimes actually you can do MRI and uh, diagnose it. All right? Let's go to the main uh, part, uh, management. So basically, as I said, the ICP, uh, the problem is high ICP. The goal should be less than 20. And uh, the main part is maintaining the CPP, which is cerebral perfusion pressure. Uh, and the goals are 60 to 70 in, in adults and uh, 40 to 65 uh, in the pediatric population. And uh, <clears throat> so initial decisions, uh, of course, call neurosurgery because uh, if you have a focal injury like epidural or subdural, 
that can that that could which is causing the main problem. You know, if neurosurgery thinks it is appropriate, they could actually take those hematoma out and reduce the pressure. That would be the initial part. But let's let's say that the neurosurgery is not there. Let's talk about only medical management for the time being. Okay. So uh, so try to quickly identify the focal injuries and uh, neurosurgery, and then if the GCS is less than eight or GCS more than eight, like in some, somewhere on nine to twelve. When the patient is detuned, <coughs> the patient requires intubation. Okay, you have to recognize signs of herniation and provide hyperosmolar oxygenation, uh, breathing support, and all that. So, as I said, if the GCS is less than eight, patient requires immediate, uh, you know, airway support. Uh, the other consideration is C-spine uh, immobilization. Uh, nasotracheal intubation is contraindicated in patients who have mid-phase uh, trauma or a base with skull fractures. And uh, they should always be intubated with a cuff tube to prevent aspiration. So uh, we always uh, try to do a rapid sequence in the uh, intubation in the ER. Basically, what, what we really do is, uh, uh, you know, we, uh, we pre-oxygenate them, try not to give positive pressure, uh, and try to, to get the intubation done as quickly as possible. Uh, they, you know, when, when the patients get intubated, they have laryngeal reflexes. They also have sympathetic reflexes. So, and that reflexes can cause increased ICP pressure, like spike during intubation. So that's why you always want to give uh, lidocaine to this patient pre-intubation. It's very important. Uh, and uh, the drug of choice for intubation is etomidate and thiopental. And they're shown to be having neuroprotective properties. And uh, paralyzing agent is typically succinylcholine, but again, there have been studies to basically to doubt their use uh, uh, in the, because it could cause raised ICP. Uh, but for most part, I mean, you can also use rocketonium. It's also uh, relatively faster acting, but it's not as fast as succinylcholine. And again, as I said, uh, avoid high pressures. So if you're using high peak pressures, high peep on the ventilator, basically you are causing increased intrathoracic pressure. And if you have increased intrathoracic pressure, there is decreased uh, drainage. So you have basically decreased drainage and so increased ICP. So you don't want to use high pressure if possible. And again, I want to uh, put this again. Like, you know, all traumatic brain injury patients should be on isotonic fluids irrespective, okay? Uh, and depending on the hematocrit, PRBCs, uh, you know, blood transfusion would be indicated. Okay, standard vital signs, uh, heart rate, blood pressure, uh, pulse ox, uh, put them on cap uh, capnography, uh, basically to monitor ventilation uh, and to, to see if the patient is not hyperventilated. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, <clears throat> You know, if the GCS is less than eight, you want to put an EVD in this patient. Oh, call neurosurgery, put an EVD. Uh, okay, now again, when, as, as I, I will actually talk about the management. So remember this, because this is important, okay? This, this whole equation is, is the center, is the crux in the ICU. We always talk about CPP, okay? So remember this, uh, this diagram. Okay, so depending on that, see this equation, uh, I've classified the management of brain, uh, uh, brain injury uh, into three different categories. Uh, so first category is decreasing ICP. So we do measures to decrease ICP. We do measures to decrease brain metabolism, right, or increase MAP, right? So either you can increase, decrease ICP, maintain the MAP, or increase the MAP, right, or just prevent the brain, make the brain go to sleep. Work less. <laughs> Ask the brain to work less. Uh, so basically, so we'll go in details about that. So sedation, analgesia, and paralytics. So basically, so imagine if, uh, if you have a patient who is intubated, and the patient is not sedated appropriately, the patient is going to cough. The patient is going to fight the vent. So, you'd, so because of the coughing, what's going to happen is there will be ICP spikes intermittently. So you don't want that. You're just waiting, you're just, you're just waiting on the patient to herniate if you don't, <laughs> if your patient actually keeps them coughing and coughing and fighting, the patient is going to have a high raised ICP, and if the patient is borderline, he's going to, he's going to herniate, right? Uh, 
The other problem is if the patient is fighting the vent, meaning that if you're trying to help with a ventilator, the patient is not being ventilated properly, the CO2s would be either low or high, and CO2s, actually we'll discuss about that, has drastic effect on, uh, on the ICP, right? So you want to better oxygenate and better ventilate, so that's why you want to sedate them. <clears throat> right. So effects of CO2. So, so what, is the, what is the effect of CO2? Uh, so on the brain, it is vasodilation. I've already written that. But what about the CO2? Uh, what, is the, what is the function of CO2 in the, in the lungs? Well, how is that different? So CO2 actually is, it works exactly opposite. So remember, when you have pulmonary hypertension, I'm, again, I'm not talking about brain right now, I'm talking about lungs right now. So when you have pulmonary hypertension, you, we, use, we decrease the CO2 and we increase the oxygen. So high O2 is required to vasodilate, to dilate, to dilate the uh, blood vessels. So the CO2 is actually vasoconstrictor, right, in the lungs. But in the brain, high CO2 is a vasodilator. So it's exactly opposite. So remember one thing, either remember the brain or remember the lung. Is it, is it clear? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so, so if you have lower CO2s, it may reduce the ICP. How? Uh, by vasoconstriction. And, uh, you know, also, uh, you know, because of the vasoconstriction, there could be decreased cerebral blood flow. So there is a point where, you know, I mean, if you decrease the CO2 very low, it can vasoconstrict a lot and cause uh, more ischemia, and that actually has a ne negative, uh, negative uh, result on the patient. So with, with all the literature, basically they talk about maintaining the CO2s in the range of 35 to 38, okay? That's, where, that's, where, that's, where the, that's the gold, uh, golden spot for the CO2s, okay? Just remember that. Now head positioning. Again, there's a debate on this again, but typically what we talk, we talk, what we talk about is uh, a 30 degrees. Some people talk about 15 and some people talk about 30, but I think universally uh, people talk about 30. Uh, uh, that's the best, like, you know, if you look at this, this graph, so as, as soon as, like, so the, the x-axis is the, is, the, is the degree of head elevation, and the y-axis on this one is the ICP, and the y-axis on this one is the CPP. So as the degree, as the head elevation goes up, the ICP drops and then starts going up after 30. And over here, the CPP drops significantly after 30. So that's the point, that's, that's the balancing point, basically. So 30 is kind of the, the, uh, the place where you want to be. And again, all the other thing that's important is you want to keep the patient's head in the midline. So if, you, if the patient is on one side, uh, the head is on one side, basically you're kinking the, uh, the, uh, the veins and basically causing more obstruction and less drainage and more uh, pressure in the, in the brain, okay? So midline and 30 degrees and CO2 35, 38, okay? Okay, now ICT monitoring. Again, indicated for patients who, whose GCS is less than or uh, equal to eight or patients who have higher GCS, but they're just getting worse and worse quickly. So uh, there, are, there are many types of uh, ICD monitoring device available. The most common that we use is, you know, this ventricular. So this is an extra ventricular drain. So look, look at this. So it goes in in the ventricles, right, versus all these three types, the epidural, intraparenchymal, and the subarachnoid, they, they go in the spaces or in the parenchyma, so what is the difference between this one and all these three? Basically, the big, biggest difference is, of course, you can monitor the ICP with all four, but the biggest plus point with this EVD is actually you could drain the ICP and decrease the pressure when you're in trouble. That's the biggest difference, right? So it's both diagnostic and therapeutic with the EVD versus others, they're just, they're not as good. Now, the other problem is, let's say if you have Let's say if you have a focal lesion right here, and if your EVD is here, not the EVD, sorry, the other types, uh, if it's here, it might not be very sensitive to take the pressure, right? Versus the EVD is considered to be much better and much more sensitive to increasing pressure because it's more central, okay? So I think it basically, uh, I've, I've only seen few of the, uh, you know, intraparenchymal. It's also it's also it's also called as bold, uh, I believe.
but I've always seen the EVD here. Just good. Uh, Hyperosmolotherapy. Yes. <laughs> Long question. <laughs> All right. All right. That's no problem. <clears throat> how often? Are, how often are the surgeons here using EVDs in the kids with severe TBI? I think I've always seen EVD. Oh well, how often? Yeah. When, when they require ICP monitoring. Yeah, but what? what so there's a fair amount of debate about how useful EVDs are uh, and when to use them. Uh, and so I'm just curious what the, the tendency is here because we don't always get consulted on these kids. I think, I, think I, mean, I think they do a good job over here. I mean, I, neurosurgery is pretty responsive, in my opinion. I don't have any complaints with them. And as I said, typically the GCS is kind of the way to go. If the GCS is less than 8 or the patient is really getting worse, even with higher GCS, that's the indication for uh, ICT monitors. Uh, I don't know if neurosurgery has any other way, uh, but they are the final people. They are the ones who decide finally. We are not, I mean, we, we always suggest, we always consult them, but they are the ones who actually get to make the decision on that. I don't know if that answers the question. Do, do you mean, Scott, do you mean EVDs versus other ICP monitors or just any I Oh, yeah. That, I mean, we use them pretty frequently. But, um, uh, and if the kids are kind of borderline when they first come in, we'll watch them and see what their neurologic exam does. If it doesn't progress or if it deteriorates, that's the point that they usually put an EVD in. Well, yeah, um, yeah, whether they change outcome or not. You know, quite honestly, there's debate about whether any of this ICP management changes outcome. None of it's particularly proven. It's just all, the only thing we know how to do. And, yeah. um, some of this may come out. There's like hypothermia studies out there that might show, shed a little bit of light on this. But most of it's just standard therapy that we can't really even study anymore. Yeah. All right. I'll keep going. Um, all right, so we're talking about uh, hyperosmolar therapy, right? So basically, uh, what it really means is, uh, you know, you increase the osmolality, osmolality of the serum. And so remember, water goes from less osmolality to higher osmolality, right? If you remember those equation when in med school, like not the equation, but the diagram, where you have uh, like higher osmolar, less osmolar, Water flows from the less osmolar area to the higher osmolar, so where there is more salt. So, what? Uh, so the the the, the, the fundamental the fundamental thing is, you know, you increase the osmolality of the blood. That way, the fluid, the the water from the brain is going to flow in the blood, and the brain edema is going to decrease. That's the whole fundamental. Okay. <clears throat> so that there are two there are two medications that we use, uh, mannitol. Uh, this has been used for, I, I don't, God knows when, like, you know, maybe like 50 years, or I don't know. <laughs> uh, but so a lot of, lot of data, uh, sorry, a lot of, lot of uh, use, clinical use of mannitol uh, is, is there. Uh, and uh, basically the dose is 0.25 to 1 uh, milligram, or 1 gram per kilogram IV. Uh, basically it causes, it causes uh, hyperosmolarity. Uh, it can cause hypovolemia, sometimes renal failure. Uh, I mean, frankly speaking, I have not used mannitol that much. Uh, it's mostly used uh, in some ERs. I mean, we have used it so when we have a patient who's kind of, a, uh, uh, you know, herniating or has high ICP, and we don't have uh, the other medication that I'm going to talk about. Uh, if we don't have that readily available, we use. I mean, I use mannitol, but I'm not. Uh, I'm not clinically so uh, <laughs> exposed to mannitol that much. Um, so what what I use and what is is used most commonly is hypertonic saline. Uh, it can be given as a bolus or an infusion. So typically, uh, you want to keep the sodium level, uh, if the patient is actually in a trouble, like, you know, herniated syndrome or high ICP or whatever, uh, you want to keep the sodium at least in the 145 to 150 range, right, in that. Uh, so what you do is actually give 3% saline. Of course, you do a serum. Uh, you, want, you want to know the basic serum uh, sodium level. And let's say the sodium level is 140. If you want to jump from 140 to at least 145, 
you want to at least give five cc's per kilogram of bolus of three percent. Now, let's say if it's so I the way I do it, I so whatever jump I want to make, so let's say if I want to jump from one thirty five to one forty five, I typically give maybe like eight cc's per kilogram or sometimes even ten cc's per kilogram. So uh, the way I've been taught is the number of cc per kilogram is the number of jump that the sodium does uh, by that bolus. So remember, so, uh, so if, it is one, if the patient's sodium is 140, and if you give him a 5 cc per kilogram, anticipate a jump of 5 uh, points on the sodium in the serum with that. Um, so, uh, and then after you give that bolus, uh, you basically can, you can start a continuous infusion somewhere in the range of 0.1 to 1 cc per kilo per hour. <clears throat> <clears throat> and, uh, you know, we always talk about central pontine malanosis and all that, but, I mean, if you're in a situation where a patient is actually herniating, do you really care about this? Although there is, uh, although there is no, uh, no case reports or anything, but uh, it's an important thing, but I don't, I, think, I don't think it's as important as, I mean, you, if you don't do that, the patient might die. So, <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, so again, anti-seizure prophylaxis, right? Uh, or should I say seizure prophylaxis? <laughs> uh, so basically, uh, this is another measure uh, to basically decrease the metabolism of the brain uh, because the patient actually has more chances of having seizures, so basically reducing the secondary brain injury because of that. Uh, and uh, there has been all the studies, like retrospective studies, demonstrate improved outcomes, and uh, basically the, the current recommendation is use the, the anti-seizure medications uh, for at least first first week of the TBI, and we always use it. Temperature control. Uh, again, this is another another study, uh, another topic of debate. Uh, the debate is whether we should hi cause hypothermia in this patient. Uh, now, the current recommendation is it's not it's not recommended. Actually, it's controversial. It's not recommended in the uh, one of the trials. Uh, but what is what is practice and what uh, what is what is recommended is actually to just uh, prevent fever, prevent hypothermia, um, and uh, because that can actually cause increased brain metabolism, increased uh, ICP. So, and, so prevent fever and prevent uh, shivering because that can increase, again, increase, uh, in, that can increase ICP. So sometimes you use muscle, muscle relaxant for uh, shivering also. Uh, hyperglycemia, uh, so any, anything above 200, try to prevent that because there has been studies showing uh, bad outcomes with uh, hyperglycemia. Okay. Maintain maps. Uh, so if you have a patient who has, so re remember one thing. Uh, so any patient with a traumatic brain injury, uh, if you see the patient, you'll re you'll recognize that the patient is hypertensive. Or more. So most of the patients actually either are they are rarely hypotensive, unless if they have like any like a severe bleeder, like and they have poly trauma. Typically, they are either normal tensive or they are kind of higher on the higher side of blood pressure. Don't try to treat that high blood pressure, because always remember this equation in your mind, right? If you, if your patient, if you have a patient with high, like you know, high chances of traumatic brain injury, the ICP is likely high. If you decrease the mass on this patient, you're going to be in serious trouble. So, uh, and the, you know, body's mechanism, and actually, uh, body's physiological mechanism is to cause hypertension, to, to perfuse the brain. So that is how the body tries to prevent brain, brain ischemia. So whenever you have a patient with hypertension in the ER, don't treat it. Uh, think that the body is treating it. Um, and always uh, try to keep the systolic pressure on the higher side, if possible. Sometimes you have to use vasopressors, meaning if you have tried all your measures, initial measures to decrease the ICP, and the ICP is not being controlled by like in all this hyperventilation uh, uh, hyperosmolar therapy, you know, uh, EVD and everything, sometimes you have to give vasopressors to increase the mass for that time so that you can perfuse the brain better. Now, this is a back, more of a backup, uh, uh, we call it uh, second tier uh, uh, therapies. We cause coma on the patient, again, to decrease the brain metabolism. Uh, and that way, uh, you know, uh, the brain, even if the brain is perfused less, the brain will still survive. So basically, we typically give pentobarbital 
uh, you know, medications. And, uh, and uh, you don't use it commonly. I think I've, we have used only once here, uh, Randy. <laughs> uh, and uh, there's no evidence of prophylactic use for it. Uh, other therapies, uh, I've seen a couple of decompressive clinectomy, like neurosurgery, when everything is done, we have treated everything, we have, you know, uh, sometimes you can call neurosurgery, and if they think it is appropriate, they can take a flap, basically take a clinic, do a clinectomy, and open the whole box. And and sometimes it's it's so. I mean, when I saw it the first time, I saw the brain actually. You know, there was like a big bulge, <laughs> and uh, we were just waiting for the brain to uh, you know get get uh, be less swollen. Uh, but yeah, sometimes that could be done. Um, and sometimes uh, lumbar CSF drainage. I've only seen one case in my fellowship, but I don't see that. Uh, Again, the whole fundamental is to decrease the ICP uh, with drainage. Uh, corticosteroids, that's a big no-no. Uh, uh, there's no benefit uh, of corticosteroids in trauma. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's really, really bad. Uh, and the only place where it is used, uh, if you have a vasogenic edema uh, because of tumors. So summary, I think 15 minutes right now. I'm done. <laughs> uh, the summary is basically involve neurosurgery qu as quickly as possible, okay? And remember that whenever you have a patient with trauma, your ICPs are raised. You want to keep your CPPs, which is cerebral perfusion pressure, you want to keep that appropriate. Uh, and again, always remember the CPP is going to be uh, MAP minus ICP. So either you want to increase the MAP or decrease the ICP. So Make sure that you know you remember that. So it's all about CPP. Okay. Any questions? I really have two questions. One is the use of decompressive craniotomy. Did you look at any long-term results of that? That just seems like such a heroic effort, and I'm not sure we gain much there. That's my bias. Uh, the second question has to do with the with uh, kind of piggybacking off of Scott's question. We see we see full traumatic brain injury from like accidents, like car accidents and so forth. But the big uh, another big area we see with traumatic brain injury are shaken babies or with who have more diffuse axonal injury. Mm -hmm. And I, somewhere back in my brain, which it could be totally fake or false, is that. Uh, I, I remember that the, the use of monitoring in those patients is not nearly as a helpful as with the more of the focal injuries like the MVAs and that sort of stuff. Um, any comments on any of those two questions? Yeah, I would like to say that for the decompressive, uh, whenever a patient actually has undergone a decompressive clinectomy, I think I've seen at least five in my whole uh, four years, five years. Uh, most of the patients actually, they die. I mean, they are that bad that they are either almost gone. Uh, I, don't, I don't see that happening in the initial part. I, I mean, I, unless if Randy has any other uh, experience. But, I, I mean, I don't, I don't really think that uh, I've seen anyone surviving to that point that we can look at long-term outcomes on them. Uh, and they might be, but I, haven't, I don't know about data on that right now. I'm sure it's going to be really bad. Uh, now, in terms of... Uh, yeah, with, with decompressive craniectomies, you know, most of the studies are single center studies, and it probably all comes down to patient selection. And so there are studies out there that show uh, improvements in outcome, or at least in mortality. Um, you know, it gets to be challenging when you're talking about quality of life and outcome scores and stuff like that. So um, you, you can, there's certainly an impact on mortality. Um, but you know the big debate is whether it's uh, whether you're really you know causing um, you know saving people that have a good quality of life, and there's no multi sutter studies on it, um, and I think it'd be pretty hard to do because um, everybody has different criteria for when they use it. So and we've debated about this because you know that has been in our experience is that when it's worked, it always hasn't been a good thing. And, and, as, no, and as far as the um, diffuse injury, um, 
I mean, we still sometimes will monitor shaken babies um, if they do have a lot of focal injury as part of their part of it. But yeah, most of those diffuse injuries, um, uh, uh, similar to an oxic brain injury, th there doesn't seem to be any um, benefit to doing ICP management in them because the the damage is done, um, and so you don't you don't change anything in their outcome by by aggressively treating ICPs. Uh, just, just one point that I remember from way back was that head and motion injuries are much more uh, destructive and dangerous than if someone hits you in the head like with a stick. Uh, that when the, the acceleration of the, from the fall uh, is uh, worse for the traumatic brain injury than, than if someone just happens to hit you. And uh, just happen to remember. So again, that. the thing is uh, focal injuries and diffuse injuries. So focal injuries, I mean, if you if someone hits on the head with a stick, probably likely that you could have an epidural or subdural that could be easily, you know, surgically taken care of, unless it is really bad. Um, but in the shaken baby, basically they have this diffuse axonal injury where you basically, uh, you know, it's very global injury, very diffuse injury. Uh, all the motor neurons, uh, you know, the sorry, the, uh, the axons, the white matter is basically, uh, uh, you know, they're injured very globally. So that's why DAI uh, or the diffuse axonal injuries are supposed to be more more worrisome. Although they don't look worrisome on the CT scan initially, but they are. Uh, and uh, yeah, just just two quick comments on things people have said. One thing is just for the learners. Most of these injuries can't be very well categorized as focal or diffuse, right? Usually they're in motor vehicle collisions and there's components of, of both. Uh, and, you know, if you've got a coup contra Q injury, you might very well have a white matter injury, shearing injury as well. Um, so just, just it's, it, we're trying to categorize things and we're always trying to put things in categories, but many times they don't fit in categories, so we all know that. And then uh, the other comment I was going to make uh, was, I think it's very, uh, piggybacking on what Randy said, I think it's very center dependent in terms of hemicraniectomy because where I trained, uh, they did that, uh, I think, on kids who are not as severely affected, and I have seen kids do relatively well uh, after hemicraniectomy. I've also seen kids do badly, don't get me wrong, um, but uh, I've seen a range, and I think that they were a little bit more aggressive about doing it there. And I don't think there's studies to say that one is right and one is wrong, but I have seen kids do well. And the other thing, actually, we cannot compare, like, you know, if the patients actually have a hemicranectomy, it's very difficult to actually compare one patient to another patient because they could actually have different injuries, as, as, you know, so there's no way to compare them. I have a question about the steroids. So no steroids in traumatic brain injury, but what about if there's a spinal cord injury as well? Well, so it's all about, uh, like, tumors. Uh, even in spinal cord injuries, uh, I don't want to wear a chronic has been used. Any more questions in the room? We've got a few more minutes. I can unmute the phones real fast. The conference is now in talk mode. Okay, if you're on the line and you have a question for Dr. Pandey, uh, you can ask now. If not, would you just please mute your phone so we don't hear the conversation in your background? Any questions? Alex, this is Virginia Powell. Go ahead, Dr. Powell. Um, a comment on the decompressive cranies. I have um, looked into that quite a bit, particularly when I first arrived at Carillion, because other places I've been, um, the opinion was that it was not helpful um, to do them. The pediatric literature is very mixed, and as Randy said, there's no good study. Um, they're just more case report type of um, papers out there and meta-analysis. There was an adult study. It was multi-center, um, European and American um, centers uh, that was conducted uh, several years ago and was actually uh, stopped early because of overwhelming lack of support of doing decompressive cranies uh, for traumatic brain injury. Thank you very much, Dr. Bell. Any other questions or comments on the line? No? Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Penny.
you're still on the line and you have a question, you can always email me at outreach at and I'd be happy to get them to our presenter. With that, we're going to go ahead and disconnect the phone lines now. Thank you all very much for joining us.